<laughs> because of the day and age in which we're living, I want to start out with some current events and as it pertains to our end time, which is, I feel, coming on us so fast. And so we're going to take maybe the first hour just looking at the signs of the time. And we're going to start out scripturally for that in Matthew 16. Matthew 16. And then we're going to spend the rest of the day laying out, probably like very few other Bible teachers are doing today, the dispensational approach to Scripture, which most of you now realize it's the only way to do it. Otherwise, you've got a mix mash, and uh, you've got a lot of things that uh, raise questions that can't be answered. But if you learn to divide the Scriptures dispensationally, you answer a lot of questions. But we'll pick that up maybe uh, before break time, if not as soon as we get to the break time. But Matthew 16, verse 1, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and tempting or testing desired him, speaking of Christ, that he would show them a sign from heaven. Now, I guess that's a good place to stop. What does the scripture tell us about the Jews and signs? The Jews require a sign. It doesn't say Gentile, Jew. And so you and I are not to be looking for signs and wonders and miracles. That, that's not in our program whatsoever. Now, that steps on a lot of toes. I can't help that. I'm not here to embrace any one denomination, nor do I attack. And I think most of you know that. But I'm going to stay with what the book says. Signs and wonders and miracles were associated between God and Israel. And they're still the same way today. Well, even in Christ's earthly ministry, see, after 2,000 years from Abraham up to Christ, God worked through the nation miracles and signs and wonders over and over because that was just the makeup of the Jewish people. All right, so now the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, are same format. Show us a sign. All right, here's his sign. Verse 2. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather. For the sky is red. And in the morning, you say, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern or you can figure out the signs of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Now, what was he driving at? Well, number one, what was Jesus' primary reason for performing miracles and signs and wonders day in and day out that whole three years? What was the number one reason? To prove to Israel who he was. You've been listening. Thank you. To prove to Israel who he was. He was that promised Messiah. And we'll look at that later today, how you come all the way up from 2000 B.C. Everything is moving the nation of Israel to the place where they could have that Messiah, Redeemer, King over a glorious earthly kingdom on the planet over which Christ would rule and reign. All right, so when he came, in order to establish who he was, that was the purpose, signs and wonders and miracles. But could they read the signs? No. Now, there were all other signs as well. Number one. Had they known anything of Old Testament prophecy, they should have understood that the fourth empire in Daniel's 490-year prophecy was now with them. It started out with the Babylonians, and then came the Medes and Persians. And hey, they weren't stupid all that. They knew history, and they knew the Babylonian empire had come and gone. They knew the Medes and Persians had come and gone. They knew the Greek Empire had come and gone. And they knew the Romans were occupying Jerusalem. What should that have told them? It's time for the Messiah to come. But could they? Blind as bats. Couldn't figure out anything. The miracles. Wouldn't tell him who he was. All right. It's no different today, beloved. Everything around us, if you know anything of Scripture at all, is just like a sound from heaven. I'm coming. I'm coming. But is the world paying any attention? No. 
Now, like someone was just sharing with me yesterday, he's in the business world, and he said, yeah. He said, they've got an inkling. There's something wrong. There's something out there in the world that's not right. But do they have a clue what it is? No. Not a clue. All right. So what we're going to look at for just these next few moments at least, what are the signs of the times for you and I today that are literally screaming at us? The Lord is coming. Now, you know, dispensationally, I'm a firm believer in a pre-tribulation rapture. I'll never back down. I'll stand up to anybody, the theologians included, and I'm not a theologian. But everything in this book points to a pre-tribulation rapture. But it's going to be followed by the horrible of the seven years of tribulation and then the second coming. So most of your signs of the end time are associated with the second coming, not necessarily the rapture. And I'm going to show you the difference here before the day is over. All right, so for us today, the signs of the times, I'm going to take you back or ahead a little bit to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, and this is one of the most obvious, not the most obvious, I'm going to hit that next, but the second most obvious sign of the times is what Jesus warned about now in chapter 24, verse 4 and 5. Now, we may have done this when we were here in August. In fact, I was going to ask, that light is pretty bright. For how many of you is this your first all-day seminar? Oh, my goodness. See, that's what always surprises me. This is the first time. See, now, we've been out here at least 11, 12, 13 times over the years. So, welcome. We hope you enjoy the day. All right, Matthew 24, verse 4. And again, the disciples are asking, what are the signs of the end? How do we know that it's about over? Verse 4, Jesus answered, and he said unto them, take heed that no man, what's the word, deceive you. What does that speak of? Deception. What's deception? Being fed a false bill of goods without realizing it. That's his number one warning to the 12. Don't let somebody feed you a false bill of goods. Now, verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, I'm not going to attack anybody by name. I'm going to just simply lay it out, and you can make up your own decision who I may be thinking about. All right, but you got the picture? One of the signs that the end is close is a tsunami, a tidal wave of false teaching. Maybe only a little, maybe much. But listen. If you go to the restaurant and have food with a little bit of arsenic, only a little bit, if you keep going there long enough, what's going to happen? You're going to die. All right, that's what people are getting spiritually in a lot of places. It may not great be a, a big flagrant thing, but they're being fed a little bit of arsenic every time they go to church. It's going to get them. But on the other hand, we got this flagrant stuff that you'd think any idiot could figure out. It's not according to this book. Now, let me show you the verses that I share with people on the phone. Now, I hope you realize that the biggest portion of Iris and I daily time now is just simply answering phone calls. We got the girls out in the office, but they're covered up with bookkeeping. And so we do. We, 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 we try to answer as many questions as possible. All right, now turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is exactly what the Lord had in mind. That's why I'm tying the two together. This is from Paul. But it's still how it's going to come to pass, as Jesus said it would, that deception, false teaching, is just going to cover the world. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles. Deceitful. See, same word. Deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Who makes them apostles of Christ? They do themselves. 
Self-proclaimed, see? Listen to me. I'm an apostle. I've got special gifts. All right, verse 14. No marvel. Don't be surprised. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? Light. Not darkness. An angel of light. Therefore, put all this together now, Paul says, Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, whose? Satan's. If his ministers also be transformed as ministers of, what's the next word? Righteousness. Now, do you see that? They're not going to come out here and say, hey, I'm a false teacher. I'm going to promote Satan worship. No, that's not what's worrying us. They're out there proclaiming themselves as preachers of the gospel. They speak of Christ. They speak of the cross. But, beloved, they're as false as a $3 bill. I had a guy call me just the other day. I've been contributing one of these. And I said, listen, you sound intelligent to me. I said, how in the world can you equate a handful of diamond rings, a private jet, living in a multi-million dollar home, and you equate that with this book? How in the world can you? But see, people are so gullible. They're buying a false bill of goods, beloved. Now, you may walk out of here mad as a hornet. Can't help it. I was teaching one night in a little country church in Oklahoma. And that was years ago, and I was out there helping them out on a Wednesday night. And uh, I don't make any bones. I don't care where I'm at. It was in a little Southern Baptist church, but that didn't make any difference. And so I just laid out the scriptures. Well, on the way out, this one gal says, all ten toes are bleeding. You know what I told her? I said, come back next week, we'll stomp on them again. <laughs> but you see, people got to get shook up. They're sitting there, they're listening to this garbage, thinking, oh, this is some man of God. Look at the multitudes that are being saved. With this kind of, of message? Uh-uh. Don't you believe it, beloved. Don't you believe it. I read a book here a while back to somebody from a listening audience sent me, and it was before, it was written before the big Asian tsunami. But the title of his book was The Spiritual Tsunami That's Coming. Maybe some of you have read it. And the biggest pile of garbage I ever read. And all he was talking about is how there would be this great revival starting in America, and it was going to be like a great tsunami wave that would just simply circumvent the globe, go all the way around through the Orient, across the Middle East, across Europe, end up back in America, and bring in the second coming of Christ. Something to that effect. Is that going to happen? You know better than that. It's not going to happen. There's not going to be a great outcalling of true believers. Oh, there's going to be a great outcalling of professors, but they're not possessors. And so here's the sign of the times. These people are coming on the scene. Now, again, read verse 15, and don't you forget it. If you don't remember anything else today, you remember this verse. Therefore, it is no great thing if his, Satan's ministers, are also transformed as ministers of righteousness. They use the Bible. They use the right language. And their end will be according to their works. Beloved, where are they headed? To a devil's hell. Now, I'm not judging any individual. I'm just judging the generalized message and what they're doing, and that's between them and God. But my book says that they're not going to be where they think they're going to be. All right, now then, the second big sign of the times. Now turn back with me to Deuteronomy. Chapter 30, you've probably heard me do this before. That's the only reason I don't like to keep coming back to the same place over and over. They all go out and they say, well, I've heard that before. Yeah, you probably have. But Deuteronomy 30. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 30, jump in at verse 1. 
And now this is plain English. I mean, you don't have to be a theologian to understand these things. And it shall come to pass. All right. I knew I was going to read this sometime today, but I didn't know when. Here's my chance. Way back in the 1300s, this theologian in England by the name of Miles Coverdale. Now remember when this is, in the 1300s. Now if this isn't dispensationalism, I don't know what is. And I put it on the screen in a couple of our tapings because it just says it all. All right, the golden rule of biblical interpretation. If, or it shall greatly help you to understand Scripture if you mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom, by whom, with what words, where, at what time, to what intent, with what circumstances, considering what goes before and what follows. All right, now why did I think of that when I looked at Deuteronomy 30? Who wrote it? Moses. Come on, I'm not going to trick you. Moses. <laughs> when did Moses live and breathe? Approximately. You don't have to have an exact birth date. 1,500 before Christ. 3,500 years back from now. That's what he wrote. Who is he writing it to? Israel, under the law. What were the circumstances? Prophecy. What did the nation have to look forward to? All right, now look at it. And look at it as a sign of today. Oh, my, lost my place. Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 1. And it shall come to pass. See, that's prophecy. When all these things are come upon thee. Upon who? Israel. The blessings and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations. Now stop. I mulled all this over again again last night. There it comes. Thank you. What point in time, at what point in time do you think Jews finally fulfilled this prophecy of being resident in every nation on the planet? Now, I'll just give you a minute to think. Well, just for example, the Western Hemisphere wasn't even discovered until what, 1400s? Well, how much longer did it take before all of South America and everything was set up in nations? Well, I haven't gone back and researched it nit nitty gritty like, but just casually speaking, I came to the conclusion that it was probably around the last half of the 1800s, just approximately, that we finally have all the nations of the world are now established. And what has happened to them? Every last one of them had Jews come in to be citizens of that country. Every nation under heaven had to have Jews within their borders in order to fulfill this uh, prophecy. All right, now you've heard me more than once refer to James Mishner, the famous author who wrote the book back in the middle 70s or 80s, somewhere back in there, and it was a story concerning a Jewish family, a lineage, all the way from antiquity up. So anyway, in the preface to his book, he made reference to the research that he had done before he ever started writing the book, and this is what he had found. Now, this is about in 1980, that in every single sovereign nation on earth, there were Jews. None accepted. That was fulfilled. All right, now, here again, God's timing is always perfect. Just about the time that that prophecy got fulfilled, God sets in motion verse 2. And what is verse 2? And thou shalt return. 
Now just look at that a minute. Think. You know, I've come to the conclusion, people read their Bible and they don't even stop to think. And I'm going to stop you off and on all day. Now think. Here we finally, after all those hundreds and hundreds of years, in fact, from 1500 B.C. until 1800 B.C., that's about what, 2300? Hundreds of years before verse 1 was fully completed. But at about the same time verse 2 kicks in, they're going to start returning. To where? To their homeland. All right, and thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt obey his voice, according to all that I command thee, thou and thy children, with all thy heart, with all thy soul. That's when it's finally completed. But everything has to begin someplace. So after we go through all those hundreds of years, from the time that Moses wrote this, 1500 B.C., plus another 1800 after Christ, so yes, 3300 years, now God's ready to fulfill verse 2 to kick things in gear to send them back. Isn't that amazing? You know, when I see things like that, and I don't see this all at once. It, this just came in in the last year or so. What an exciting phenomena that God spent 30-some hundred years getting verse 1 fulfilled and then turns right around and starts kicking in verse 2 and brings them back. Now, why am I saying that? Beginning in about 1890, some of the Jewish leaders of the world at that time were getting the idea that they wanted a Jewish homeland for the Jews. Theodore Herzl was one, uh, a couple others I can't think of right now. But anyhow, they started hitting, and of course, Great Britain was the nation of nations at that time. So some of these Jewish leaders started bombarding the British government for helping them establish a homeland for the Jew. Well, the first thing the British came up with was to designate a por portion of Africa, that they could have that. No, they didn't want Africa. They wanted Palestine. They wanted their ancient homeland. Well, a lot of groundwork was laid, and uh, you had some of your big Jewish confabs then around the turn of the century, 1900, so that by the time you got to World War I, Great Britain was now leaning to the idea of giving a good portion of the Middle East as a Jewish homeland, reaching clear across the Jordan River. It was called the Balfour Agreement. But then the Arab world started putting up such a stink that Great Britain chickened out and backed away from that. But then again, as a God thing, in the midst of World War I, Great Britain was running out of the gunpowder and so forth that they could import from the Orient, and they were getting desperate for explosives. And along comes, who was the man? Who knows? The Jew. And what did he discover? TNT, just in the midst of World War I. Who was it? Nobel. That's why you have the Nobel Peace Prize. He got to feeling guilty of all the wealth that he had accumulated because he had invented or discovered this destructive power of dynamite, TNT. So he established the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, anyhow, because of Nobel then, this, this intelligent Jew, Great Britain then began to feel an obligation to the Jewish people. So once again, they start making move to establish a homeland in the Middle East for the Jew. All right, so beginning then with 1900, the Arab world is starting to exhibit more and more hatred. The Muslims are getting more powerful, and the Jews are filtering back. To the Middle East. Now, if you like to read and you don't mind small print and if you don't mind a lot of detail, I've recommended it in my newsletter. You find the book by a gal by the name of Joan Peters, and the title of it is From Time Immemorial. Now, it's kind of interesting that she titled that book before Arafat started saying it's been ours since time immemorial. And she showed from all of the government documents, beginning with about 1900, how that all these government maneuverings behind the scene, and I guess you all realize that, don't you? We don't have a clue of what's really going on. There is so much going on behind the scenes that we have no idea, and it's getting more all the time. Well, anyway, behind the scenes then, there was all this maneuvering 
to try to help the Jews on the one hand get back to their homeland and on the other hand pacify the Arabs who were fighting it tooth and nail. But it's an interesting read how that all these cablegrams between Jerusalem and London and Vienna and all that, and it was all working together to establish a homeland for the Jew. All right, so since 1900 now then, verse 2 has just been more and more being fulfilled so that today you and I can look at the whole Middle East and what can we see? The signs of the time the number one which Israel is back in the land. Now that wasn't an accident. It wasn't because they had more power and more money. It was a providential act of God. That's almost like saying a, a deja vu all over again, isn't it? But it was a providential thing that those Jews being forced out of especially North Africa first and then out of Middle East, and they came into that absolute desolate Middle East. All right, are you still back in Deuteronomy? Go back to Leviticus. Go back to Leviticus, chapter 26. And this is exactly what the Jews came back to. Leviticus, chapter 26. Drop in at verse 32. Now, of course, the, the immediate prophecy here was referring to the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity when Israel would be emptied out, taken down to Babylon for 70 years and come back. But it also applies to any time that the Jew was absent from Israel. And that was established over and over. All right, verse 32. This is what would happen any time that the Jews are out of the land of promise. God says, I will bring the land into desolation. Your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished. At what? The total desolation. Now, you know, I just can't imagine how desolate the land of Israel was before the Jews started coming back. I've read it to you in times past. I've used it on the program. I haven't got it with me today. But it was out of a book written by Mark Twain, who was traveling the land of Israel between Haifa on the north and on down to the Gulf of Elot, the whole length of Israel, back in the middle 1800s, about 1866, 67. And the language that he wrote speaks of nothing but desolation. He said, nothing will grow here. Even the weeds of the desert do not grow. We did not see a living thing for mile after mile of travel. I would never want to live here. It is total desolation. Well, that was in the middle 1860s. And that had begun, of course, with the destruction in 70 AD. And every time Rome or anybody else tried to build cities, earthquakes would level them. Earthquakes were constantly. And then the land of Israel, of course, the northern part became a swamp, and malaria just devastated anybody that would try to settle in northern Israel. So God kept the land a total desolation from 70 A.D. until the turn of the century, 1900. And then I can remember, you've probably heard me re refer to it, when I first became aware of it, when I was still just teaching small home Bible studies up in Iowa in the early 70s, and one of the fellows in my class had been with uh, the American Army during World War II, and he had been uh, assigned to the British Army in Palestine for whatever reason. But anyhow, the point I wanted to make was he would tell our class at times oh, what a horrible, desolate place Palestine was, or Israel as we call it today. He said, it's nothing, nothing but bare desert, nothing. Well, then I came across this article by Mark Twain. Well, it's in that way all the way up from 70 A.D. that God kept it desolate. All right, now if the land was desolate, where were the Arabs? Well, they had left. See, they had already left. 
They were all over the Middle East. Now, as soon as the Jew started coming back, and you pick this up in Joan Peters' book, and by the way, I didn't mention it, when she first started the book, she was intending to prove that the Jews had no business being there. She was an anti-Semitist. But the more research she saw, her whole line of thinking was inverted. That no, it wasn't the Arab who belonged there, it was the Jew. It's been their homeland since Abraham. All right, so anyway, as the Jews started getting pressured out of North Africa, due to the persecution of the Arab world, and they started clearing the land, one of the first things they did was drain the Hula swamps, got ahead of the malaria mosquito, and began to bring the land into production. Who starts coming back? Well, the Arabs. See? Because now there's work. Now, Unless you study history, this is exactly what is called big population overturns. Wherever there's jobs, that's where people are going to go. All right, so when the Jews start coming back, clearing the land, developing irrigation, and there were jobs to be had, the Arabs came back. And, of course, Great Britain was in charge of the Middle East at that time. And so, just like all through Jewish history, there was that element within the British government that hated the Jew, and so they would try to encourage the Arabs to overrun the Jew, and so the whole phenomena was a God thing because in spite of all the opposition, the Jews developed the land. And of course, the first time Iris and I were there was in 1975, and at that time it was still mostly desolate. It was just in some of the valley areas, where they were developing the orchards and the wheat fields and some dairy farm. But see, every time we'd go back then over the years, you could just see it was just exploding. More and more wheat land and more and more uh, orchards and more and more buildings. And then I think we were over there one time in about 1998, and I had read it in one of our news magazines. There were more construction cranes. You know what I'm talking about, the ones up with the big barn. There were more construction cranes in Israel alone than the rest of the world put together. Now think about that. It was just booming, high-rise apartments and, and everything, just all over the place, see? Well, now, of course, you go over there and, and you swear you're, you're in America. Those of you who have been there lately, you can't hardly tell the difference. they got the same kind of interstate system and... All the uh, hotels and your restaurants, no different than here. Well, it didn't happen by accident. They're backed by God's design. But to make my point, it's a what? It's a sign of the time. Now, you know, a couple weeks ago, one of my listeners up in Minnesota taped a program from a lady who has a Saturday morning radio show. And she's a converted Jew. She's always at my seminars up there every summer. And uh, last couple times, she even had her own little book table next to Iris. So we know Jan real well. Maybe some of you heard her. Jan Martell is her name. But here, oh, I suppose a month or two ago now, she was interviewing the pastor of one of the biggest Lutheran churches in Minnesota. In fact, it's the church that we've used the last few years for our Saturday seminars. And I'd never met the gentleman. But anyway, she was interviewing him because he had just recently latched on to end time prophecy. And so she was asking him blunt questions. She said, now, doctor, when you were in seminary, didn't your professors ever talk about the end times? Never. Now, if I've got mainline Protestants here today, and I'm sure I do, you'll know what I'm talking about. You never heard prophecy. You never heard of a rapture. I know you didn't, unless you're in a unique little portion of some of these denominations. Well, now, this, this Lutheran pastor of this huge church says, no, never. I well, said, when you and your fellow Lutherans get together, don't you ever talk about end-time prophecy? Never. Well, he says, then what has finally changed your mind? Well, he says, I suddenly realized that Israel was back in the land, and that was no accident. So he said, I started rethinking Scripture. But see, this is 
90%, 80%, I don't know, of Christendom. They have no concept of end-time prophecy. And again, that's a whole day seminar in itself. How did that happen? Well, you see, just as soon as Rome destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and the Jews were scattered to the then known world, what did those early church fathers begin to assume? That God was all through with the Jew. They've lost their home. They've lost their temple. God's all through with them. So who's taken their place? The church. The church has taken Israel's place. All right, now then you come up about 200 to 300 A.D. One of the primary movers and shakers of this concept was one of the early church fathers, so-called, by the name of Oregon, O-R-I-G-E-N. And he began to write extensively now that God was all through with the nation of Israel. They had lost all their Old Testament promises because they had rejected and crucified their Messiah. But... All their promises and blessings were now being transferred to the church, quote, unquote. Okay, then along about 400 A.D. comes the guy that you've all heard of, Augustine. You've all heard of Augustine. Now, he was the bishop of Hippo, which meant that he was part of the, of the rising Catholic organization, and he had a lot of clout with the church, and so Augustine picked up the writings of Oregon, and he just exploded it because, you see, 75 years earlier, Constantine had declared Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. No longer to be oppressed, no longer to be persecuted, but now it would be sanctioned. Well, what happened to the church? It exploded in numbers. And that's when all the pagan practices started coming in. Christmas, Easter, because as these unsaved pagans came in and became part of the so-called Christian church, they said, well, now, wait a minute. We've always celebrated this way and this way at this particular date, and the church accommodated. Come springtime, well, now, we've always associated springtime with fertility and the fertility rites, and so all these things came in and began to pollute true Christianity. All right, but now here's the kicker. Augustine had a lot of clout, and as the years went by, from 400 until finally Martin Luther has his theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg, who is Martin Luther emulating almost to the nth degree? Augustine. Just go back and read history. Martin Luther is always referring to Augustine, Augustine, Augustine. All right, now if I got Lutherans in here, how much of end time prophecy have you heard over the years? Almost none. Why? Because you see, Augustine was a proponent of replacement theology, of not giving Israel any due, and so all the promises made to Israel are now given to the church, Martin Luther took that right with him. All right, I'm not going to stop with Martin Luther. Who's the next big reformer? And he's coming in like a tsunami again today. John Calvin. Calvinism. Now, what does Calvinism teach? Nothing concerning end-time prophecy. How many of you guys listen to Hank Hanenberg? Anybody? Just one. Oh, my goodness. I never do either. All I know is what I hear from guys like him. But see, Hanenberg just totally ridicules our idea of dispensational teaching. He is strictly on the ground of John Calvin and Martin Luther and Augustine. And so most of Christendom, beloved, has been blinded by all this false teaching, and it's scary. How many people over the years of all these church members really found true salvation? Well, you know what I have to compare it with? The nation of Israel itself. Now let me give you a scripture verse. Come back with me to Isaiah. Now I know, you're, you're, you're going to come away from here a little bit scary. And you should. Because see, multitudes, multitudes, Satan has deceived from day one to stay away from the Apostle Paul. 
Now, this is what we're going to come to later today. I am a Pauline advocate. If you want true salvation, if you want a true understanding of this book, you better get with Paul, and I'll show you why before the day is over. But all right. Back here in Israel's history, 700 B.C., Isaiah chapter 1. Israel has now been the favored nation for 1,700 years. From the time of Abraham, 2,000 B.C., up to 700 when Isaiah writes. Now look what Isaiah writes. By inspiration. Now, that's the other point I want you to remember all day long. Every word in this book is the inspired of the Holy Spirit Word of God. Every word. Now, granted, there can be a little insignificant word that may be an error, but it'll never affect the doctrinal whole. All right, so by inspiration, look what Isaiah writes concerning the covenant nation of Israel after 1,700 years of history. Verse 9, except or unless the Lord of hosts had left unto us, now don't forget our, our rules of interpretation, who's writing? A Jewish prophet. Who's he writing to? The nation of Israel. What's the purposes? They are in complete apostasy. They're in idolatry. They've turned their back on the truth for the most part, all right, but not all. And here is what I call the framework of God's dealing with the human race even to today. How many people in ancient Israel at the time of Isaiah were true believers? All right, read on. Unless the Lord of hosts had left unto us as a nation a very small Remnant. Now, ladies, what's a remnant? Just a little bit of the bolt. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a fashion expert, but I remember when I was a kid going with my mom into a fashion, uh, into a fabric store, and she would always ask for a remnant. So that's where I learned the use of the term, and it's just the last few turns on the roll. That's the remnant. It means the same thing here. In other words, in the nation of Israel, usually around 7 million people, how many true believers? Very few. Now, that's scary. And that's the way it's been all the way through human history, beloved. And it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the Lord said himself, when I come again, will I find faith on the earth? What does that mean? It's almost going to be gone. But see, we're so taken in by all these big numbers and all this hullabaloo. Uh-uh. That's not where it's at. It's that little small remnant. We're not making all the noise. But here we are. We're just the few. And that's why if the rapture took place tomorrow, they won't even miss us. Do you know that? Oh, some immediate family will. But the world in general, they won't even miss us because we're so few. But nevertheless, if I don't make any other point, make this now, that even in ancient Israel, the true believer who stayed with it was only among the very few. All right, now then, in order to pursue bringing Israel back into the land, go back with me now to Ezekiel, or go ahead rather, go Ezekiel 36. And don't forget what we're still thinking about, signs at a time. We've got this great tsunami now of false teachers claiming to be preaching righteousness, but they're emissaries of Satan. We've got the return of Israel back to their homeland. It's been working now ever since 1900. And there they are against all odds. They should have never survived. And again, stop and think. Here you've got a little nation that has usually been between 10 or 7 and 10 million people down through history, scattered to the four winds. What should have happened to them? By normal human experience, what should have happened to them? Well, they should have intermarried and disappeared. But did they? 
No. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew to this day. Now, of course, more and more intermarrying, but nevertheless, they, they never assimilated. Any other race of people has done that, they disappeared. Europe, you know what they're saying now? That if the world keeps going, by 2050, you will no longer be able to identify a German or a French or an Englishman. They're going to lose their identity. To whom? To the Muslim. See? The Muslim women are having 10 babies to one white. Now, what's that going to happen? They're going to disappear. But the Jews didn't. So think. That's why I can sit here and I can rest on this book and I don't have to take any guff from anybody. This book proves itself. And the Jew is the frosting on the cake, see? All right, now look what uh, uh, Ezekiel 36 said. In view of Deuteronomy 30, verse 2. After they've been scattered to every nation on earth. Then verse 24 of 36 says, I will take you. See? It's a God thing. God did it. I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of how many countries? All. See? There they are in fulfillment of Deuteronomy. And I will take you out of all those, all countries, and will bring you into your own land. All right, now I'll turn over to chapter 37, and you got the chapter with the vision of the dry bones. And it's most often totally misinterpreted. But the vision of the dry bones, white as snow, out there in the valleys of the world, were symbolic pictures of the nation of Israel, that when they're out of the land and away from their temple and where... They're like a dead people. All right, so they've been out in the nations of the world hundreds and hundreds of years, just like carcasses of animals that have died, and they're laying out in the hot sun, and their bones were as white as snow. All right, so you know the, the, the unfolding of the chapter, how that the knee bone came to the knee bone, as the old spiritual put it. All right, this is where they got it. All right, now let's just jump in and verse 7. These dry bones, which are a symbolic picture of the Jew, out amongst the Gentile nations. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together. In other words, the Jew is being exercised to get out of his Gentile place and get back to his homeland. The bones came together bone to bone. Verse 8, and when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Now I look at Israel today in that situation. They're there physically, but nothing spiritually. But they're there. They're their own sovereign government, and they have one of the best militaries in the world. But they're still absolutely destitute of anything spiritual. In fact, the vast majority of them are atheists or agnostics at best. All right, verse 9. Then he said unto me, Prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds. That merely means come from every part of the planet, from all the places where you've been, when you've been uh, scattered. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So, he, Ezekiel says, I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them. They lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. Now, the fulfillment of that, of course, will be at the second coming of Christ. All right, but now look at verse 11. Lest you wonder I'm, I'm uh, not exactly on, on the right mark. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Now, many of you have heard about the so-called ten lost tribes and that the only true Jew left are Judah and Benjamin. Don't you believe that garbage either. There was never a tribe lost. Never. They've always been intact and they still are. In fact, uh, at dinner last night I made the statement. 
I would be willing to bet my ranch and everything that's with it that all 144,000 young Jewish men from all 12 tribes are already there. Now, that's my own take. All 12 tribes are already there. God knows who they are. And when the day comes, here they go. So that's how close I think we are. Okay, so he says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Our bones are dried. Our hope is lost. We're cut off. In other words, they'd been out there hated by the world, struggling just to maintain their Jewish identity, identity, but here they start coming back, and they've been coming back. And, of course, now it's slowed quite a bit, but back in the early 90s, I know one of the times Iris and I was over there, my goodness sakes, every place we went, we ran into Jewish immigrants from Russia. And uh, in a couple instances, the only way we could communicate with them was through their kids. Their kids had already learned enough English, but the parents couldn't. But they had come in from Russia. Oh, my goodness, uh, there was a couple million of them there in just a couple years' time. All right, all providentially, all because when Russia fell apart, the doors were opened, and they were able to come out and go down to their homeland. All right, now then, let's take one more two verses here. Uh, still in chapter 37. Come up to verse 21. And God tells Ezekiel now, Say unto them, the nation of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither the Lord thy God has scattered them, according to Deuteronomy, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation, not two like it was in Jewish history, the northern kingdom and the southern, they'll come as a multiple or a single nation out of the multiple tribes, and I will do it upon the mountains of Israel. Okay, now that is the major sign of the times. Now, let's see, we've already gone an hour, and we're going to go another 15 or 20 minutes, so we'll stay on this for a little bit. I'll just stop and think. Right where you're sitting, I want you to just stop and think. What are some more of these signs of the times? Just what can you see out there with your biblical background that, hey, this is just screaming at us that the end is coming? Well, one of them is the apostasy, the falling away. When I got to Columbus, Ohio last month, we were going to be in a little Lutheran church for a Friday night, and uh, then I went back and had their Sunday school on Sunday. But it was a dear old conservative Lutheran, and uh, I've known him for a good many years. And his newsletter, I could have written it more than once. So we've been on the same page for a long time. And we were sitting there at lunch, and the first thing he said, Les, are you aware that our preaching of the cross and the atoning blood of Christ is under attack like never before. Yes, but I wasn't as aware of it as he was because he's, he's more into the, uh, the Internet and so forth than I am. Well, he says, I'm going to give you some papers that you can look at after leave. So that evening after a service in his church, he gave me a reef of stuff, and I got it home and read. And it is amazing how many seminaries, professors, are now just totally ridiculing the concept of the atoning blood. They call it everything but anything nice. One of them put it this way, can you imagine any father lifting up his son to be murdered on a Roman cross? They just ridicule it. Well, what is that? That's the apostasy, the falling away that's coming. And more and more churches and denominations are doing just exactly that. They're refusing the virgin birth. They're refusing the resurrection. They're refusing the atoning blood. They're refusing the second coming. They don't even talk about it. So what does it become? Just a dead religion. All right, another one. I may step on some toes. Do you realize what a tsunami we're having of women preachers? Now, I got nothing against women. But they don't belong in the pulpit of a huge church. I don't even mind if there's a situation in a mission field, and I had one in Minnesota, a little country church. 
They couldn't find a pastor. There were only 25 members, and they were too far to be driving anywhere. So they found this young lady who had had some seminary training, and she agreed to be their pastor. I got no problem with that. But when women take over big congregations and their bishops or their denomination, beloved, that is contrary to this book. And it's coming in just like another tsunami. Everywhere you look, there's more and more women getting involved in all this. It's a sign of the times. Well, I could keep going. All the things that you're seeing, all this wild, wild music, is that according to this book? No, that's the world. I don't care what Rick Warren says. That's the world. And you do not bring the gospel using the world. Now, I'll come up to Paul a little sooner than I figure. When Paul came into these Roman cities, like Antioch, or like Corinth, did he have a big entourage go ahead of him for about 30 days and get everybody ready for this great apostle that's coming? No. Did he come with a great big musical fanfare to gather the crowd? No. So how did he approach them? Preaching the gospel. That's what he meant in 1 Corinthians. He said, I thank God I baptized none of you, for I did not come with an excellency of speech. I came to preach Christ crucified. And that was his message, and that's all. But, oh, what have they done with it today? They've added everything but the kitchen sink. And that brings me back to one of my favorite illustrations that I've come up with since I was here three years ago anyway. And I just suddenly ran across it one time, and it's been one of my favorite illustrations. Come back with me to Genesis. Now, don't lose the concept. We're still looking at signs of the times, but now I'm trying to show you how the world of Christendom has totally obliterated that beautiful, finished work of the cross. Genesis, chapter 1. Drop down to verse 31. And I want you to remember this. Practice it. When you get home tonight, if you're here as a couple, practice it on each other. Because I found this is the most beautiful illustration in all of Scripture to show what most of Christendom is doing to the gospel. So take this slowly and carefully. Verse 31. At the end of the six days of creation, God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now what do you suppose the Hebrew implies? Not just good, it was what? Perfect. That's the word I wanted. It was flawlessly perfect. There wasn't anything that he could do to correct or to improve. It was perfect. Consequently, what could he do next? Well, he rested. Now, let's stop, bring it into the everyday experience. And as a rule, I have building contractors when I share this. If you're a building contractor and you have just finished a turnkey contract and you hand the key over to your new owners, we'll say it's a beautiful million-dollar home, do you expect to be called back to correct something? Now, wait a minute. I'm talking about a human contractor. <laughs> yeah, you will. I've never talked to one yet, but they don't have to go back. A door doesn't swing wide or one window sticks. There's always some flaw that has to be corrected. But see, we're not talking about a human contractor. We're talking about God. And when he called something perfect, it was so perfect, he could just sit down and rest. Wasn't anything else he could do? You got the picture? All right. When's the next time God did the same thing? Hebrews, all the way up to the New Testament. And I love this. I, ho I hope I can get you to love it. Hebrews chapter 1. Now, these are two portions of Scripture, real easy to remember. The last verse of Genesis 1, the next couple of verses in Genesis 2, where he sat down, he rested, because there wasn't anything more he could do. 
All right, now you go to Hebrews chapter 1, and you get the second time in all of biblical history where God did something so perfect, so flawless, he could do nothing more but sit down. It's all done. All right, here it is. Verse 1, God, the whole triune God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth. But this same God now, in verse 2, hath in these last days, and that again, that takes a half hour to explain. The first advent was the beginning of the last days. Let's see. Didn't get a whiteboard. You know, when I was here last summer, I guess I'd get, let the cat out of the bag. All day long, I was wishing I had a whiteboard. I came in here and had one of the services on Sunday morning, and again, I thought, oh, if I only had a whiteboard. And when they gave the benediction that Sunday morning, there was a great big one on the wall behind me, <laughs> and I missed it. But anyway, if, if I had a, a board here now, what I would show is that at Christ's first coming, that was the beginning of the last days because they had no idea of the church age. See, there was no concept of the church age until you get to Paul. So everything was going to keep right on coming to the second coming. And so it's called the last days. And that's hard for us to put together. Now, when we come to the language of our day, it's the latter days. We are now in the latter days. But the last days were beginning the first advent. All right, so hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he, the Son, hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. In other words, he's the creator of everything. All right, now verse 3. Who? God the Son, Jesus of Nazareth, being the brightness of his glory. Whose glory? The Godhead. Jesus was the brightness of the glory of the Godhead. He was the express image of his person, that is, the Godhead, and here it comes, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself alone purged our sin, and when and where did he do that? In the death, burial, and resurrection. And when he completed that plan of redemption, and by it he purged our sin, what did he do? He sat down, beloved. Why? There wasn't anything else he could do. There were no more instructions. The instructions for this dispensation is believe the gospel. And what's the gospel? the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son of God. Okay, no more was this glorious gospel presented or revealed to the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter 1, how by revelation he made known unto me, Paul said. And Paul takes it out to the human race. What do humans start doing with that glorious gospel? Adding to it. Now think a minute. What have they added to that finished work of the cross? Now, come on. Don't be shy. Baptism, communion, church membership, good works, and now it's tongues. Unbelievable, beloved. And the illustration I give, how would you like to? Maybe you've heard me give it, especially you ladies. You men, you've been in the military. If you polish brass, you know what a headache that was. But brass is almost impossible to bring to a flawless finish. But it can be done. Can be done. All right. How would you like to have had a big, beautiful brass vase, and you've worked probably two, three days to finally get the last smudge off of it? Sorry, but I don't like two-year-olds. Here comes this little two-year-old with a handful of butter, peanut butter, and jelly, and he says, "Oh, Mama, can I hold it?" What have you done to my vase? Are you getting the picture? That's what men did to God's finished work. It was perfect. It was flawless. Could they leave it alone? Uh-uh. 
No, that's not enough. You got to believe this. You got to believe that. You got to believe that. You got to do this. You got to do that. And they have totally smeared it. Now, the other day, somebody called whores of whores, where this preacher, and I can just hear it, this preacher was going on and on. How about every believer is going to be there as witness at the great white throne, and they're going to be weeping their hearts out when they see their loved ones cast into the lake of fire. Is that in this book? No. And I called her back, and as you tell the guy, he's a bold-faced liar. That's what you have to do. They're lying through their teeth when they preach that kind of garbage. But can't you see how God must weep when he sees that beautiful, finished work of the cross utterly covered up with all the finagling of men? That's what's happened. That's what's happened. And I'll stand here without apology until they take me out and shoot me. Beloved, you're not going to be saved with anything else but believing that that Christ of eternity the Son of God, the creator of everything, took on flesh and went to that cross and suffered and bled and died and then rose again the third day and proclaimed salvation to the whole human race. Amen. And if you're here this morning and you have never trusted that gospel, for goodness sakes, wherever you sit, I don't have to give invitations. I'll think... I'm not against them, don't get me wrong, but I do not feel that it's God's way of reaching hearts. And I'll take you to a fellow here in India. Maybe he's here. You know, I've got to be so careful when I give some of these stories. Because, see, in Kokomo a few years ago, I was given the story of a nun who came out of Pennsylvania, and uh, I was sharing it to the Kokomo crowd, and at break time, this lady comes up, and she says, Les, I'm that nun. <laughs> But anyway, I had a fellow call me now a few years ago, and he said, Les, I've been a Catholic all my life, but he said, thanks to your program, he said, I was saved, and he said, I've never gone back to the Catholic Church. But he said, I was getting to feel a little uncomfortable not going someplace, so he said, there's a church down the street. So he said, one Sunday, I just decided I'd walk down and go to that church. I'm not going to give you the nomination. So he, the sermon was okay, and... Uh, he said, I kind of enjoyed the service, but then, now listen carefully. But then he said he turned on his mood music. Now, those of you who are accustomed to con uh, invitations, you know what he's talking about. Then he turned on his mood music, and he turned on his hypnotic powers of persuasion, and I got up and left. Well, he said, the next day, the doorbell rang, and he said, here was the preacher. He says, hey, he says, you were in my church yesterday, weren't you? He says, yeah, I was. He says, why did you leave? So he says, I rehearsed it. He said, everything was okay, but when you turned on that mood music and you started twisting people's arms to walk that aisle, he said, that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the flesh. And he says, I left. And I said, amen, brother. You better believe it. I've had I don't know how many people in Oklahoma have come into my class. They've been members, again, of the major denomination in that area of the world for years and years, and they come in and they hear the gospel for the first time. And I'll never forget the testimony of the one lady. She was about 40, and she said, Les, when I was 14, we had an evangelist come to our church, and he preached all week. And it's on Friday night, and no one had ever come forward. And, oh, she said he would beg, and he would cavort at the invitation. And nobody ever came forward. So it was on Friday night, as a 14-year-old girl, she said, I thought, that poor man, he's going to go home and tell his dear wife, not a single soul got saved all week. So she says, I got up and walked to the front. She says, I was never saved. But she said, that's why... A lot of people do it. And you know what? It wakes you up. How many people have been forced by psychological maneuvering to walk an aisle and they seemingly accept Christ and all this, but they're never saved. And they go through life and that's, oh, you ought to read our mail. Last I've been in church all my life. Never was comfortable that if I died, I'd go to heaven. 
But after listening to you for just a couple months, now I know I'm saved. Well, I don't save them. It's that gospel, beloved. Throw away all the junk and just simply stay with the cross. That's where it's at. And it changes lives. Well, I've had some of the most ungodly men in Oklahoma come to trust that gospel, and it changes lives. I guarantee it. But, oh, they're always working on gimmicks. And that's not God. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit brings you to a place to believing, then you know you've got real salvation. And from then on, yes, God's going to leave you into a place where you can fellowship with fellow believers and you're going to want to walk and, and please the Lord with a Christian walk, but to be constantly harangued and, and have your mind twisted, no, I, I, I just can't agree with it. I'm sorry. But anyway, a couple more signs of the times. Technology. Look at the technology that's just exploding all around us. My goodness, I had a guy show me a little pocket-sized computer the other day. And he said, that thing has more power than the great big room-sized computer of 20 years ago. All in a shirt pocket. And it's still coming. They're, they're, they're not true. It's just going to get more and more. In fact, I read an article in a science magazine some time ago. The big push in the... Uh, research community is to make everything smaller. They're trying to get everything just as small as they possibly can. And that's why they can put a room-sized computer now into a shirt pocket. Well, technology. How else will the world see the two witnesses laying on the streets of Jerusalem, but now they can pull out their cell phone and, my goodness sakes, what in the world's going on in Jerusalem? Isn't it amazing? And you know, the first time I ever was aware of that prophecy was when I was a kid in the church back in Iowa, and uh, we were at least dispensational to that point. And the folks were talking about it up in the front seat, and I was a kid sitting in the back. Well, how in the world can people in America see people laying on the streets in Jerusalem? Well, back in the early 40s, that was pretty hard to comprehend. But see, now we take it for general. All right, so all of these things I can just throw into that one pot, signs of the times. Just a quick review and we'll let you have a break. Israel back in the land. In the news. Every day. Now think about that. I had a young man, I think maybe when I was here last summer. He said, Les, how can I witness to my fellow 20 year olds without them just think I'm being a preacher at him? And I said, well, just use current events. Just ask them, hey fellas, you ever stop to think that a little nation of only 5 million people in a state the size of half of New Jersey, is in the news every day? You ever think about that? Why? Why is all the oil in the Middle East? Why? Why is all the turmoil in the Middle East? Because, beloved, that's where everything started, and that's where it's going to end. And why don't people wake up and think? That's all you have to do. So even as you go about your tasks in, in the days ahead, just stop and look at the things that are going on around you that are all signs of the time. We're getting close. I think within five years. Now, I say that trepidatiously. But I think within five years. I hope I can live that long. Now, you know, I'm going to be 80 in a few weeks, and I hope I can hit 85 because I don't want to go to that tomb, that tombstone. I don't want to go to that graveyard. <laughs> I want to go up. But I think it's close enough. I think we're close enough that I can look forward to that, and so can many of you. But the signs of the times are screaming at All right, now before we take a break, I'm going to show you one more. Sorry about this. Come back and meet us, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now the signs that the Lord gave in Matthew 24 were for the second coming. The closing days of the tribulation, the horrors, the death, the destruction... It's going to be beyond human comprehension. There's hardly going to be a soul left living. There will be a few, but not many. But all right, now here is the Apostle Paul's take on the end time for you and I looking for the rapture. Now this is one of my major points, that the tribulation has to follow the rapture because Paul never uses anything pertaining to the tribulation as a sign of the rapture. Not a word. The second coming is nothing but. 
But here is what we can look for. You don't have to look for it. It's already here. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, you want to remember, Paul thought he was going to live to see the rapture. That's his language. Then we who are alive and remain. Then we, and so forth. So he was writing, even by inspiration, with no knowledge of a 2,000-year period of time. He thought the body of Christ would be completed in a short period of time before his life ended and all these things would be consummated. All right, so this know also in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now watch the language. There's no death in here. There's no massive destruction. There's no weapons of mass destruction. It's a social breakdown. All right? For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Does that nail it down? Oh, that's all people can think about. I've got a young man here that's in the corporate world, and I asked him some time ago. I said, when you, when you have your bull sessions in the coffee uh, break room or something like that amongst your corporate big weed, big wigs, do you ever talk about end time things? Never. He's less. All those guys have got on their mind is how big a house they can build, how many cars they can own, and where they can go on their next vacation. Well, what is it? Lovers of self. They don't care about anything else. All right. Covetous. They want everything that everybody else has got. Boasters. How many million did you make last year? See? Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Is that an unknown? Hardly. Unthankful. Unholy. Here's the next one. Without natural affection. What's one of the signs of the end time all around us? Homosexuals. How do I know? As it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. So shall it be when the Son of Man cometh. It's a sign of the end, beloved. And they're taking over. Even in their small numbers, they're practically taking over. They've got more clout than you and I can put together all over the world. It's a sign of the time, see, unnatural or without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers. My, do you realize what that's doing to innocent people? Do you know, that that's why I don't want to travel without my wife. Do you know that any of you men, if you would be alone with a girl under the most innocent of circumstances, and if she would walk out of that room and accuse you of molesting her, do you have a chance the snowball in hell has a better one? <laughs> and we're getting letters from men in prison all over the country. That's exactly what got them in trouble where some girl accused them of molesting her. And he says, less I'm as, and, and I believe them. It happened again just the other day in our Oklahoma paper, where some 14-year-old girl accused her father of, of having molested her. Why, they arrest him, no questions asked, and he'll be in, in the pen before you can shake a stick. All right, what is it? False accusers. And it's happening throughout our society, see? Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. You know what my grandsons tell me? What kind of guys do the girls want today? The deadbeats. Yeah, they're the ones the girls go for, the deadbeats. The one you and I wouldn't even give a second look. Why? They got their priorities all screwed up. It's frightening. All right? Traitors. My, every time I read that, there's one great big name that pops into my head. What is it? The New York Times. <laughs> Too many of you don't know what it is. The biggest bunch of traitors in the world. Everything they do, had they done it in World War II, they'd have been executed. Traitors, and nobody thinks anything of it. Heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now verse 5. 
having a form of godliness. Oh, they've got their big, beautiful churches, their big megaplexes. How much godliness? None. I had a lady, I was hoping maybe they'd slip down from Chicago today, but she came out of Roman Catholicism several years ago now when she was a young mother of 38. She's one of my prime examples of what the gospel can do. And she caught my program, which is on at 12 o'clock noon in Chicago, had never, ever listened to anything but Roman Catholicism, had never listened to anybody on radio or TV, but my program came on at 12 o'clock, and so she said, I sat down and listened by the end of one half hour. In fact, I shared with her last summer in Minneapolis. I said, Laura, I don't want to tell this wrong. Was it one program? She said, less one program. The Lord opened her heart. She's 38 years old, young mother. And she said, the Lord opened my heart, and all of a sudden I saw the truth of the gospel. Never went back the Catholic Church. The next time she wrote, she said, pray for me that I can win my family. My parents are both old country Catholics. Her dad was Irish Catholic. Her mother was Armenian Catholic. But you know, it wasn't but a year, and that gal had won both her teenagers, I mean, on fire kids for the Lord, her husband, her mother, her father, a couple neighbors, and she was burdened for a twin brother. And she called just a few weeks ago to say that, Les, my twin came in, so she even had him. But she was invited to one of the big mega churches in Chicago last winter. And she says, I knew better than to go. But she said, just to pacify my friend, she said, I went. And she said, do you know what? She said, in the whole hour I was in that church, I never once heard the name of Jesus Christ. I would never go back. They don't even know how to use the name. Well, you see, this is what this verse is talking about. Oh, they've got church. They've got their music, and they pray, and they may read a verse of Scripture. But godliness, they don't even know what the term means. And Paul says, they deny the power thereof from such turn away. Now listen, this is where we are. You can't argue with this. This is exactly where we are. So what does it tell us? This is our sign that we're getting close. The second coming is always seven years ahead of us. Don't ever forget that. I don't care what they say. The second coming is going to be seven years beyond when we get out of here. And I'll show you why before the day is over. But listen. We have got to understand that we are amongst the remnant few. And don't back down for a minute. Because the Lord will take care of you. Your, his grace will be sufficient. And uh, it's the only thing he expects of us is to be a testimony remnant that are true.